just a short message this morning. Um, I just want to share a couple of uh, thoughts uh, of my own. I, I believe that, that the church has lost the meaning of Easter. Incidentally, if you want to turn your chairs around a little bit, yeah, please feel free to do so. Um, but I, I think the church has lost its way a little bit regarding its, its very important times, Christmas and Easter. Christmas is all about presents and partying and this, that and the other. Uh, Easter... Yes, uh, it's Easter. Uh, how many of us got, you know, I, I just want to commend David and Tiana because they, they were going away, but they stayed for the service this morning. And then they're going afterwards, Ian, Ian and Abir are going after the meeting. But unfortunately, in, in most circles, um, God takes second place. At the two times when, it, when it, he should be highlighted more than ever before, you know, and I was talking with Tiana before about the, the state of Christianity. And um, Tiana used a word, I was trying to think of a word, you know, the church today, 2,000 years later, is lost its personalization with God. You know, we know about him, we, we know of him, but do we know him? Yeah, the cross. What, what was the significance of the cross? Do we understand what the cross was all about? Or was it just a means by which Jesus died? I'm, I'm going to just quickly look at a few points pertaining to the crucifixion, uh, just to hopefully help us to understand a little bit. And I want to take this passage, just one passage of scripture today, this one passage, and I want to point out some things because this is Matthew's account of the crucifixion. And he says, now this, this, this is a lot more significant than you think it is. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. Okay, somebody tell me the significance of that. No. He was completing the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. He was finishing, fulfilling the law. The Paschal Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And it says from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, the sixth hour was the, uh, the morning sacrifice, and the ninth hour was the afternoon sacrifice. And there was darkness over all the land. Why? Because all the sin that ever existed in mankind was gathered together at that one point. God, God the Father was heaping the sins of the world upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And it was so evil, it was so dark, that it, the darkness filled the land. These, these are things to, to take seriously. This is what happened at, at the crucifixion of our Savior. And he says... About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I want to express something here. Jesus was not backing out. He, he, was, not, he was not saying, God, why aren't you, you know, like we do when we're going through a tough time, God, why aren't you delivering me out of this? Why aren't you doing something? That's not the reason he said that. He said that to let us know what was happening. And if we go back into the Garden of Gethsemane, some not, not much time before this, when, um, when Jesus said to the Father, he said, Father, that this cup could be taken from me. Now, a lot of people think that Jesus was trying to back out of going to the cross because it's a horrific death. Jesus was not trying to back out. He did not want to be separated from the Father. He did not want to be separated. He'd never been, in all of eternity, Jesus, the Word of God, had never been separated from his Father. But he knew that on the cross, when the sins of the world were going to be heaped upon his shoulders, the Father turned his face away, could not look at the sin. And Jesus knew that was going to happen. And he didn't want to suffer separation 
from the Father. That's why he said in the garden, would this cup could be taken from me. And then he goes on, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is, this is how Jesus would have felt at the time. He'd never experienced this before. He'd never experienced this separation from the Father before. And he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Jesus did that for us. He did that for us. He, he became separated from the Father so that we could be drawn closer. Some of those who stood there when they heard that, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. Incidentally, on three different occasions, they offered him wine on a sponge. There are several different reasons for why he might have done this. But I, I believe in this particular case, he wouldn't take it because it was a, um, a narcotic. What, it, what they were giving him to numb the pain that he was in. He wouldn't take it. He wouldn't take it. He had to go through. You know, in Hebrews it says, For the joy that lay ahead, he endured the sufferings of the cross. So Jesus did not take any way of escape. No way of escape. He went straight to the cross. He suffered terribly for us. He even suffered that, sep that moment of separation from the Father. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now please notice that. They didn't kill him. They did not kill Jesus. They couldn't kill Jesus. Jesus couldn't die because he was sinless. Death came into the world through sin. Yes? Jesus was absolutely pure, holy, righteous, and sinless. They couldn't kill him. He yielded up his spirit. And he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So remember that. They didn't kill him. He had complete control over every situation. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked. You know the temple curtain? It was nine inches thick, and it was torn from top to bottom. Notice from top to bottom. What is the significance of that? The significance is, it tells us in Hebrews, that it was making a way into the Holy of Holies for us. Can you imagine that? You know, the Father said, it's finished. It's finished. Well, Jesus said, it's finished. And he tore the, 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 the curtain which was separated his people from, from the presence of God in the tabernacle. I mean, this is what Jesus did for us on that cross. And, and we, lose, we lose personalization of that. He did it for me. And he goes on and he says, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked. And the rocks were split, and many of the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. That is the only account of that. It's not in any of the other Gospels. What was that? You, you know, when they died in the Old Testament, they didn't go to heaven. You know that, yes? They didn't go to heaven. They went to a place called Abraham's bosom. Uh, Seventh-day Adventist is probably where they get the idea of purgatory from. There's no purgatory. But if you could appreciate what, what had happened, was that all the Old Testament saints who had died obeying the law, and, and they were in Abraham's bosom waiting for the Messiah, waiting for their promised king. And when he came, when he died, when he yielded up his spirit, the price was paid what did Jesus mean when he said, it is finished? The law had been completed. He was the morning sacrifice, the sacrificial paschal lamb that was sacrificed in the early morning. And he was there on the cross still at, at three o'clock in the afternoon time of the afternoon sacrifice, he was there to complete both high sacrifices. This was a high Sabbath. 
And Jesus, Jesus had lived his life according to the law. He completed the law. And when he yielded himself up as the spotless lamb of God, and his blood was spilled, the sins of the world were gathered and placed upon his shoulders. And then he said, it is finished. It is finished. The law has been completed. Now we need to realize that because a lot of people still think we have to ab ab adhere to the law. No, we live under a different covenant. We don't live under the old covenant anymore. And a lot of those Old Testament saints that died obeying the law were being translated out of Abraham's bosom, wherever you want to call it, and they were being taken up into heaven. And some of them, it says, were seen walking around Jerusalem. I can't begin to imagine that. So the, the veil of the temple. Remember, the Bible talks about the veil of our flesh. This, this was the veil. This was Jesus' veil, the flesh in which he lived. He sacrificed it on the cross to reveal the glory of God. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. If ever you wanted a testimony as to who Jesus was, this is one of the most powerful testimonies because they were the Roman centurions who killed him. They realized that they were wrong and he was right. And so that, that little passage of scripture has got so much in it. If we, if we are really serious about getting to know Jesus better, read this passage, absorb it. Look, look at the, the, what was going on at this particular point in time when Jesus hanging on that tree. I can't begin to imagine the suffering that he went through on that cross. And if you want to get a little bit of an idea, read Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is all about Jesus describing himself on the cross, the pain and the suffering that he was going through. And so I, I am just so eternally grateful for Jesus Christ for what he did that 2,000 years ago. And I don't want it to be a distant memory. I want it to be real in my life today. What he did 2,000 years ago is still real for me today in my life, and it will be tomorrow and the day after that, until the day I die and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And so just, just um, quickly go through some points from that, to, to, um, to remember at this Easter time, Jesus was the promised seed right back in the Garden of Eden. The woman's seed would crush the head of the serpent. It says the serpent would bruise the heel of the coming seed. Jesus Christ was that coming seed, prophesied right back in, in Genesis chapter 3. And so we need to remember that, that the cross was not something that God thought up afterwards. This was all planned before God even created. So we've got nothing to worry about, no matter what we're going through. If we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we've got nothing to worry about, no matter what's going on in the world today. Jesus was the only person who was born to die. Everybody else born to live. He was born for the sole purpose of dying. Uh, I've already mentioned would it, when he said, would that this cup could be taken from me? It wasn't the cup of suffering. He knew that he had to go through that for the joy that lay ahead. He endured the sufferings of the cross. So it wasn't that. He did not want to be separated from the Father. When he said it is finished, he's talking about the law. Moses' law had been completed in every jot and tittle, even to the degree of the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice on this high Sabbath day. He completed the law to the jot and tittle. That's uh, Hebrew exclamation marks, a jot and a tittle. For the joy that lay ahead, I mentioned that, and the wine was probably a narcotic which was to dull the, the senses. And uh, Jesus wouldn't take it. He wouldn't take it. 
And so, you know, as, as, we, as we sit here this morning in the comfort of uh, a lovely building that God has provided for us, we've had a, a, a nice meal, nice time of fellowship. Let's just remember why we're here today, this Friday morning. I, I think the chances of this being the actual day that Jesus <laughs> was crucified is very remote. The day that we celebrate Christmas on, Jesus wasn't born on that day. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which day he was born on. The fact is, he was born. He was born. It doesn't matter which day he died. But that he died is what's important. And so, you know, I, I get involved with a lot of discussions on Facebook in doctrinal circles about, you know, should we be keeping the law? Well, I think that Jesus, when he said it, he finished, he completed the law. Now, is the law done away with? No, it's not. If you're not in Christ, you're still under the law. So you better live your life under the law the way it's supposed to be lived, and nobody could do it. Nobody could live according to the law. And so we, we need to appreciate that when Jesus came and he set us free from the works of the law, from the requirements of the law, you know, I still have a lot of debates with people about is Sunday the Sabbath or is Saturday the Sabbath? Who cares? Who cares? Jesus Christ is my Sabbath. He's my rest. He said, anybody that is weary and heavy laden, let them come to me and I will give them rest. He is my rest. And so people who, who argue and fight over these doctrinal differences, I think to myself, they just don't know Jesus. If you know Jesus, you don't wrangle and argue. And the scripture says, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. So as a child of the living God, I live for one reason and one reason only, and that's to please him. I want to know him better. I want to be more familiar with the scriptures. I want to know him. I want to personalize him. That's what we want more than anything else. And unfortunately, this Easter time, when, when it's, it's the, probably the most important day, more so than Christmas, because when he came into the world, which was great, the word made flesh, that's great, but at that point he hadn't done anything. But when he died on that cross, he, he gave me an opportunity for eternal life. He gave me the opportunity to live in heaven forever. Because while I was in Adam, I was lost and going to a lost eternity. But now that I'm in Christ, my future is secure. I just keep my eyes on him, get to know him better and better. Amen? Amen. Father, we do thank you for the cross. Lord, more than that, we thank you for the one that hung on the cross. Jesus, we can never thank you enough for what you've done for us, Lord God. Lord, and, and though we may argue and wrestle and debate about various topics of doctrine, Lord, we just want to know you. Lord, we want to know you. And we ask you, Lord God, that at this particular time of the year, Lord, that you would help us to just press in that little bit further. Take us from one faith to another this weekend, Lord God, as we, as we consider the cross, as we consider the resurrection, which we'll discuss on Sunday. So, Lord, we commit ourselves afresh to you, Lord God. Be blessed this day, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Are we, are we